I hear many people say that calculus is the math for change and dynamic systems and things that engineers should study and scientists should study because of the things changing in the world all the time. I have a different definition for calculus. I don't view calculus as the math of change because most of the math that you will be doing as paper is going to appear as if it is not changing. So instead, I like to think of calculus as the logic of approach. The logic of approach. So what do I mean by this? Well, if you take a moment and think about most of the other classes we've had, like geometry and algebra, they're all about answers for situations that are, uh, they are, they're, they're just simply like two is two and two apples are two apples, but we're not ever talking about approaching only having two apples. That seems very odd, but it's something that I want to get you very comfortable with because it's the foundation of calculus the idea of approach, the logic of approach. So let me maybe kind of give you a scenario like this one here. Because after all, math is a model of logic. So let me show you how you've actually been doing the logic of approach without even realizing that it was calculus. Let's say that you are walking down the stairs in the middle of the night. Have you ever done this? And then have you ever gotten to that last stair only to find out that it's not a stair and instead it's a floor? At that moment, you remember being surprised that is a conflict between two different logic centers in your brain. One is the logic of approach. It's saying that there was a step, I'm on a step, so the next thing should be a step. But the other is saying, oh my gosh, no, this is a floor. So this is what I mean, contrasting the logic of what is versus what did we approach. Now, this of course does not mean that we are in any ways illogical for assuming there to be another stair. We do plenty of logic of approach in our daily lives. I can plan tomorrow's breakfast and it's not even here yet. However, there's plenty to back up this plan on because there was a breakfast that I had two days ago and a day before and I had one today and I will likely have one tomorrow. This logic of approach is a new model of mathematics, and it's one that's going to allow us to talk about very, very difficult situations, ones that we can't calculate directly, but that we know there's an answer for anyways. One of the first instances of this logic of approach are what I'm going to refer to moving forward as limiting values or limits for short comes from ancient Greece in about the 360 BC era. Now, let's keep in mind that all across the world, there has been a challenge to find the area, the size of shapes that are not easily broken down into squares. Now, just as a little recap, if you're going to teach area to a child, you would say that, for example, you could measure a rectangle by how many square units you have inside of it. And this is because one square is a very easy basis by which to be measuring area. In this situation, you would have three groups of five squares, so that would be 15 square units that you would have in this rectangle. Even the triangle, although it doesn't fit very nicely, can be split apart, reorganized, and so that it fills up something that can be broken down and related into rectangles. But when you get into curved shapes, all of a sudden you cannot do that as easily. Specifically, the circle was plaguing the ancient world for thousands of years because it appeared in so many places, yet to determine how much of a circle there was, was a question that did not have an immediate answer. So just imagine that you're a merchant who sells products that are in the shape of a circle, or you're somebody who is selling real estate and the real estate has a curved plot of land. You don't know how to fairly price your product, nor how much product you even have, because you cannot talk about the size of a circle. In modern day Iraq, about 4,000 years ago, it was first estimated that the size of a circle could be thought of as three times larger than the square created from its, the circle's radius. So if you again take some kind of circle, and you look at just simply the radius, so we'll go from the middle on out and measure that out and create that into a square, which would be this shape right here, 
you could view the circle as approximately three of those. Now this was later refined to 3.125, but this was the closest estimate we had for the size of a circle for about 3,000 years, until it was eventually replaced with Egypt, where Egypt was able to analyze the situation and they came up with an approximation of about 3.165. And I'm gonna show you how they did that. The approach that Egyptians took when trying to solve this problem was likely inspired by the game of Mancala. Now Mancala is a game where you put pebbles into little divots on a board and you move the pebbles around. And anybody who has played Mancala will have noticed that some amounts of pebbles fit very nicely inside these circular cutouts, while other amounts kind of seem a little bit clunky and uneven. That was likely the inspiration for Egyptians to approach the size of a circle by overlaying it with a grid and then just eyeballing which of these squares they thought should be counted as mostly inside of the circle. And then by counting the circles or the squares that are mostly inside of the circle, they could take all of those pebbles that they had used for, to count and rearrange it into the shape of a square. From there, Egyptians could recognize that the square of the radius had in it approximately 81 pebbles, whereas this square over here had 256 pebbles. So they could do a ratio of 256 to 81 and get approximately 3.165. So for the longest time, the area of a circle was calculated not by pi times the r square, because pi hadn't been invented, but by 256 divided by 81 times r squared. So where did pi come from? Well, as it turns out, pi is a number that we are still searching for. It's an elusive, irrational number that continues for infinitely many digits. But the first approach that got significantly closer to the value of pi was that of Archimedes. Now Archimedes was a Greek mathematician and philosopher, arguably the best scientist of all time. He is known for inventing not only fantastic feats of engineering, but war machines, machines that could supposedly reach into the ocean, grab attacking warships, pull them out, and then drop them so that they would burst. He was killed when his hometown was attacked by Roman soldiers, and he was so invested in his geometric calculations that when the Roman soldiers told him to move away from the desk, he refused, telling them not to disturb his circles, and just for his insubordination, got stabbed through the heart with the Roman sword. But before he died, and before he got old, one of his first accomplishments was being hired by the pharaoh of Egypt to calculate the size of a circle. Now, Egypt was spearheading mathematical discovery in the day because they had a lot of need for their buildings. They were making fantastic structures, but also they had to contend with the Nile, and the Nile River would flood every single year. Now, let's imagine for a moment that you are pharaoh, and just like today, Pharaoh collects his money through taxes, and taxes are best if they are put upon the richest so that you can gain the most money for the government. Well, in order to effectively determine who has the most money without doing an audit, you instead collect the most amount of money from those who own the most land, property taxes. Well, if you are having a large number of people in your civilization living next to the Nile, and the Nile floods every year and erases people's property markers, then you have a lot of property disputes where people are claiming they own less land than you have record for. And if you can't have a record because it is not a rectangular shaped piece of land, then you don't have an argument to push back on them with. So Pharaoh was in a place where he was effectively being stolen from by his citizens, and he needed to hire Archimedes to come and help out with finding the size of a circle. And Archimedes came up with an interesting approach similar to what the Egyptians had already done, but one that was allowed to expand much more quickly. The approach that Archimedes had was that instead of looking at a circle as a circle, and instead of trying to fit a circle into a square, 
Instead, tried to think about how he could draw a shape that got closer and closer to a circle. So he started with a square. He put a square inside of a circle. You can see that here in green. And that's a four point polygon. Well, by then adding four additional points to the polygon, he went from a square to upgrading it to an octagon. And as you can see in the blue, it already looks much more like a circle. Well, then from an octagon, you can multiply the number of points by two, and you could then draw a 16 gon, which fits even nicer into this circular shape until eventually you get something that looks almost indistinguishable from a circle. This right here is not a circle, it's actually a polygon. It's just a polygon with about 256 different sides in it. But it's practically indistinguishable from a circle. Now the advantage of working with something that had straight edges at the edge of the polygon is he could put a triangle on the inside of it and use the area of a triangle to relate it back to a rectangle to be able to get a better and better approximation. This is the logic of approach. So notice the difference. One is saying that you are going to measure a circle as it is. However, Archimedes looked at this scenario and said, I don't need to measure the circle. I just need to measure something that gets closer and closer to being a circle. And this is the logic of approach. As a result, he was able to get one of the most accurate estimates of pi, one that even though his calculations were done in 300 BC, it was used until about 1600 AD and was only replaced by one of the inventors of calculus. So the important thing to recognize here is there are plenty of things you have been working with that hidden within them is a story. So pi, for example, is a number. There is an actual numerical element to it. However, it's also a story. It is a story of approach where you simply have hidden behind it a number of different techniques. The Egyptians could have continued to put smaller and smaller pebbles into the circles. That would have been a way to approach the value of pi. Archimedes had an approach that was called the method of exhaustion because it does take a lot of work and a lot of pencil, a lot of paper to be able to do that many calculations with that many polygons. But the important idea here is that pi is the limiting value. It's the limit that you get to through a number of different procedures. I want to show you a couple of other examples that are different from this one, but that allow us to use the logic of approach. And they're ones that you'll explore, if not in this class, then in your later calculus classes. So let's next take a look here at this idea of 0 0.99 repeating. Now this is something that you've probably seen maybe as early as grade school mathematics, but let's take a moment and dig into this because hidden within this number is calculus, its limits. First of all, what does it mean to have 0 0.99 repeating forever? Notice that that isn't a number that I'm talking about. It's a story. It's the result it's the limit of a process of taking nine tenths, adding it to nine hundredths, nine thousandths, et cetera, et cetera. Now the question I have for you is where is that number on the number line? So let's draw our number line. I'll put zero here and one here, and I would like to know where to put the dot representing 0 0.99 repeating. Would I put it right next to one? What does that mean? How far away from one is it? Do we have a number for what one minus 0 0.9 repeating would be? Well, to answer this question in a roundabout way, let me show you a really interesting proof, one you can pull up at parties because it tends to stump some people. Most people would agree that if I did one divided by three, that that would be equal to 0 0.3 repeating. And most people would agree that 0 0.3 repeating is 3 tenths and 3 hundredths, etc., etc. Now here's where things get fun. What if I was to multiply both sides by 3? So I'll do 3 times 1 third and 3 times all of this. Well, 3 times 1 third would be 1. 3 times 3 tenths would be 9 tenths. 3 times 3 hundredths would be 9 hundredths and we would continue on. And if you put 9 tenths 
nine hundredths, nine thousandths, etc., etc., you get 0.9 repeating. So the question becomes, is one the same thing as 0.9 repeating? And as it turns out, it is. Now this blows many people's minds because they don't see these as the same thing, but it actually is the same thing. Why? How can that be? It's because we've been talking about a model of logic different than what is, and you just hadn't recognized it. Take a moment and listen to the language. Point nine repeating. That's not a number. That's a story. That's a method. It talks about an approach. It talks about trying to not only start at nine tenths, but then add more on top of that and more on top of that and more on top of that. And so the question becomes, where does that approach end? And it doesn't end because it's repeating on forever. So the question becomes, where is it on this number line? Is there a number? There has to be because this is perfectly good math that I'm doing. I'm just doing addition of fractions. Where does it put me? Well, I argue that it puts you right at one. Now, if that feels weird, think about it in reverse. And this is where sometimes some limit logic will really help you out. What if you put it someplace that wasn't one, right? What if you put it someplace that was right next to one? So we'll put a little dot here to represent that. My question for you is, where is that dot? Is there, how big is this gap? If you say that that gap is 0.1, I'm going to say that no, this gap is too large because 0.9 repeating will come within that gap. And what about if it's 0.01? Well, I could say again, there's going to be a certain point in this process when I get to a closer value than wherever you have placed your dot. And the result of that logic means the only place you can place your dot where I cannot prove you wrong is right there on the number one. So this 0.9 repeating is the number one through a couple of different ways. One, algebraic intimidation, if you will. I kind of think that's what this approach is. But also because the logic just stands that if you want to repeatedly add 0.9 and 9 and 9 and 9, if you want to do this forever, and you want to claim that it's on the number line, then any place you put it other than one, I can prove to you that you are wrong. That means that 0.9 repeating is one. In other words, one is the limiting value for this process. Now, it wasn't always believed that this was the case. For thousands of years, people were talking about the logic of what they called infinitesimals. Now, infinitesimals sound like infinity, but they are the opposite of infinity. They're not the biggest number, they're the smallest number. And notice that I'm using biggest number very loosely here because it's not a number. But nonetheless, people were using them to create some, some math and some logic, and people still do that to this day, although not the method that we teach in this class. And so they would call this something like epsilon, where epsilon was just simply this smallest number ever. Think of it as how people were originally exploring the atom in science. Atom is a word that originally meant the smallest possible particle. When you can think of epsilon as being the smallest number, but there is no such smallest number. How would you find the smallest number? Where does it go on the number line? What happens if you add the smallest number to the number one? What happens if you subtract it from the number one? What happens if you add two of these epsilons together? How many epsilons do you need before you're able to get back to the number one? These were questions that were plaguing mathematicians in the 1600s and 1700s. And after hundreds of years of debate, it was decided that this idea of infinitesimals was not well-founded. And it was disposed of until about 30 years ago when we decided that there actually was a pretty good basis for it. And every once in a while in this class, we'll be bringing it up in tribute to the original founders of calculus. If you're still feeling a little overwhelmed by limits, don't worry, we're going to take a look at a few other examples. So the next one I want to take a look at is let's use story of the wall. This is one of my favorite paradoxes, and it goes as little something like this. Let's imagine that I had a ball, and I take this ball, and I'm going to throw it against a wall. But I can look at this situation in two different ways. The first one is if I take the ball and I simply place it halfway between, and then I just simply cut the remaining distance in half again, and I cut the remaining distance in half again, and I cut the remaining distance in half again, and I continue this forever and ever and ever, Will it ever touch the wall? And many people here would say, no, it does not touch the wall. There will always be a gap. 
But then I could challenge that by just simply taking the ball and throwing it. And we all know that it's eventually going to smash into the wall here. And I would push back and challenge you and say, in order for the ball to hit the wall, wouldn't it have had to cross halfway between and halfway of the remainder and halfway of the remainder? What is happening in the situation that makes us think that something can't be, but also must be? That's a paradox. And it's because we're looking at this through two different lenses. This right here is the lens of algebra, is the lens of something that is. But this right here is the lens of calculus, the lens of limits, the lens of approach. And we can logic to ourselves that, sure enough, at any moment before the ball hit the wall, it would not have contacted and we would have still had a remaining gap. But once we introduce the idea of forever and say that we're going to repeat something forever, now all bets are off. Now you can't tell me a place that I stop because I have already introduced this idea of repeating forever. So this is the idea again of limiting values. It's not about something that I actually reach. It's about something that I approach forever. All right, let's do another one. So now let's take a look here at limits as they relate to speed. And this is going to be one of the first things that we explore in this class is the idea of speed. And we're going to be using a thing called tangent lines. But first, let's talk about speed. Speed is something that pops up all the time, we can agree, in the real world. It's very applicable. And we don't even have to be talking about the speed of objects. We could be talking about the speed at which stock prices change. So what do we know about speed? We do know that, for example, in this graph right here of position versus time, that I could look at speed as saying that it took me between the one and three second mark, it took me two seconds to travel from 10 to 30, which means that from three seconds back to one was 30 meters back to 10. Another way of saying this is that the slope of the line is 20 over 2 or 10, meaning that this represents the traveling speed of 10 meters per second. And we can see this again in the graph because what we're doing is every single time simply going over one second and up 10 meters, over one second, up 10 meters. So the idea of speed is nothing more than the slope of this line. Now let's compare that to the second graph. In the second graph, we have something that is accelerating. And I can see this be because between the zero and one second mark, we can see that it went up about 10 meters. But between the three second mark and the four second mark, it looks like it's gone something more like 30 meters. So it's speeding up. Now the question becomes, how fast is it going at the two second mark? this one right here. Well, we have a number of different ways that we could try to compare this. We could try to choose a later instance in time. We could choose a time at four, for example, and we would get an idea of the change in distance and the change in time. But what if instead we wanted to compare that to three? At the three second mark, we would get a different distance and a different change in time. And what if we compare that instead back to the one second mark? We would get another change in distance compared to change in time. In fact, we're going to continue to represent this thing as slower and slower if we just involve more of the slow time and faster and faster if we involve more of the fast time. So how do we actually get the logic to say that we have a speedometer on a car telling me how fast I'm going? Well, it becomes the logic of limits. And without going into too much detail, the logic goes, perhaps we don't need to look at how I am changing over one second, but instead I could look at how I am changing over half a second. And instead of looking at how I change over half a second, I could then look how I'm changing over one quarter of a second or a millisecond. So the speedometers in our cars are not waiting two seconds before telling us how quick they're going. They're using very, very small measurements as a way of approximating that limiting value. The speedometer is always lying to us, but it's always lying to us by so little that we can't tell, nor do we really care. 
All right, last idea of limiting values. So the entire thing here is to get you comfortable with the idea of saying that we can approach things logically without having to worry about what they actually are. And the way that we're going to be exploring this most in the class, at least to get ourselves acclimated, is using functions. And these are set up as riddles. These are word problems. They're, they're ways of kind of trying to trick your brain and make sure you've really got it. So make sure you're taking time to dive deep into this material. But similar to that step problem, the stair problem I was talking about, we can use that idea of approach when we're talking about where function values are approaching versus where they actually are. So first let's start with an easy example. Let's use an X value of negative one. And we're gonna draw a little staircase here. And we're gonna say, as I get close to negative one, where did I expect to approach? And we could say that I expected to approach a height of zero. So add an X value of negative one the height of this graph was equal to zero. But that wasn't what we said. We said the approach. So in other words, as X gets closer to negative one, then Y gets closer to zero. So zero is our limiting value, and it's also our actual value. To put this back in case of the story, this is like that stair that I am stepping on before I hit the floor. All of the other steps, I expected there to be a step and there was a step. So there's no problem. What I expect can absolutely be what I have. But now let's look at a harder situation. Let's now look at what happens at the X value of negative one half. So again, we're gonna look at this as our value of approach. And I'm going to say that I am approaching, 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 and I have no problem. In fact, as X gets closer and closer to negative one half, Y gets closer and closer to the limiting value of one. So one is my limit. It doesn't matter that there's not a graph there. It just matters simply that as I get closer and closer to an X value, I get closer and closer to a limiting Y value. And this is also true when you come at it from the other direction. When you come at it from the other direction, you also have that as X gets closer to negative one half, the Y value gets closer and closer to one. So this right here is the logic of limits. But if I asked you about the logic of values or the algebra, or the what is, if I said what happens when x equals negative one half, we would say that y does not exist because there is a hole there. Notice the contrast between these two models of logic. So it is my belief that if you can take time to really understand how all we're looking at is the world through a different lens with this idea of limits and how through that lens things can be different than we expect, the rest of the class becomes significantly easier because we're always going to be building on this new model of logic that says sometimes I care about what things are, other times I care about what I expected them to be.